So, dear panelists, dear all, good morning and good afternoon, depending on the, on your time zone. <laughs> Welcome to the very last session of our series, Rethinking Museums. So, these conversations between French and Sri Lankan museum professionals and related fields have touched upon uh, various topics, but we have purposely decided not to be specific uh, to one certain type of muse museum. However, for the closing session, we wanted to concentrate on archaeological museums, as they have been among the first ones established in Sri Lanka, and their influence has remained ever since. Um, so more than a century after their establishment, we wanted to question what is their role today and how can they position themselves when being confronted to conflicted pasts and to contemporary challenges, such as illicit trafficking of cultural goods. And uh, do identity politics play a role in archaeological museums? And are there challenges any different compared to, uh, to art museums? Um, so these are a few of the questions that we will be uh, discussing today. And to address it, we're very happy to be counting among us very uh, four very distinguished guests. So we have uh, Ashley DeVos, who is a senior architect and conservator. He was trained as an architect and landscape architect in the UK before studying con conservation and heritage management in Rome. He has won the South Asian Architect of the Year Award on three occasions, as well as the Lifetime Achievement Award from the Sri Lankan Institute of Architects, two PATA Heritage, uh, P -A -T -A Heritage Awards, and six Sri Lanka um, IA Design Awards. Um, Ashley DeVos is president of the Wildlife and Nature Protection Society of Sri Lanka and the Royal Asi Asi Asiatic Society of Sri Lanka. He's member of the Gold Heritage Trust and the National Trust and of the advisory board of the Department of Archaeology. He holds a seat at the Governing Council of the University of Muratua and at the Council of the University of Kelania. He has presented his publications in more than 19 countries and has been awarded several national awards, including the Desamayana, the pride of the nation. Um, Catherine Barra is an archaeologist who has been responsible for operations and studies on diagnostic and excavation sites at the National Institute of Preventive Archaeological Research in RAP in France for over 30 years. Her research is more particularly oriented towards geoarchaeology urban and rural occupations of the late antiquity and the dark ages, uh, as well as medieval and modern urban civil and religious evolution. Her taste and her interest for dissemination have naturally led her to set up outreach activities for the wider public. She has proven her expertise in content and mediation practice during her participation in several workshops and creative hackathons. She's also a graduate in science museology and has participated in the development of several archaeology exhibitions, including Retour à Moulin Quignon in 2018 and uh, Camargue Archaeologie et Territoire in 2015 at the Musée d'Art Antique. Jagad Gerasinger is a Sri Lankan contemporary artist and archaeologist. He has been a significant driving force in the development of Sri Lankan art since the early 1990s. His own art, uh, mostly as a painter and draughtsman, is deeply informed by his society's actions. His work examines and critiques Sri Lankan anxieties responding to collective attitudes. As he identifies them, thinking themes such as nationhood, religion, identity, and confrontation for commentary. Jagat Gerasinger holds a Master of Fine Arts from the American University in Washington, D.C. as a co-founder of the Tirta Collective and the moving force behind the collaborations such as the Colombo Art Biennale. Uh, he has lectured on the local contemporary art scene internationally, along as his work as the head of the Postgraduate Institute of Archaeology of the University of Kelania. Sophie Delpierre is the head of the Heritage Protection Department at the International Council of Museums, ICOM, uh, which she joined in 2017. Uh, in this position, she leads operational programs, trainings, and awareness raising activities related to the protection of cultural heritage from the museum's perspective. She regularly represents ICOM at international conferences on the strategies to fight the illicit trafficking of cultural property. Uh, previously at ICOM, she was the legal advisor and institutional affairs coordinator. Before joining ICOM, she has worked on the implementation of the 1970 Convention of the Means of Pro Prohibiting and Preventing the Illicit Import, Export, and Transfer of Ownership of Cultural Property at UNESCO from 2018 to 2015. Uh, 20, 2008 to 2015, sorry. She actively contributed to the revitalization of, the, of this convention and drafted numerous working documents and legal notices on the circulation of cultural goods. 
So as always, as, of, um, as the other sessions, we'll start with these uh, four presentations and then have about an hour for the questions and answers with the audience. Uh, so I invite you to write your questions in the chat box during the discussion and they will be answered in the second part of the session. And the discussion will be also uploaded on our YouTube channel and is being recorded for um, the Facebook Live as well. So I now uh, leave the floor to our first presentation by uh, Ashley DeVos. Bonsoir. Can you hear me? You can hear me? Yeah, okay, good. Uh, <clears throat> I, for example, as a, as a young student, I was very interested in archaeology. And basically, I could imagine myself one day, like Carter, discovering my own tomb. So my whole reading in my early age was on archaeology. And uh, basically, my father had done, died early, so I was brought up more by my mother. One of the things that uh, we come to is that when, you know, I don't know about France, but in Sri Lanka, we have the O-level stage of education, right? That is before high school. And uh, one day she asked me, what are you going to do? I, I, I thought, my gosh, at least there is someone now who's interested in me. I said, I want to be an archaeologist. She just looked me straight in the eye and said, look, leave the digging in the ground to the undertaker. Now, do you know who an undertaker is? I don't know what the French word for that is, but undertaker is the one who buries dead bodies and so on. You know, He collects the body from the house and then goes and buries it. So she said, leave the digging in the ground to the undertaker. You do something else. So I, I went into architecture as a compromise of what I was trying to do. So that was very interesting, but my love for archeology span never left me. I had always been interested in, in archeology. span Now, for example, what is archeology? span Archeology span is the scientific study of materials of the past and so on, right? Uh, what is interesting is that uh, archeology span is the process, but the art artifacts that archeology span brings up is a culture. Now, to me, they are cultural objects born from a dynamic process encapsulated in a cultural matrix. So it's a quite complex, actually. The concept of this, you know, we talk about scientific archaeology, but the concept grew out of conservation laboratories where people used to look at objects under microscopes and so on, and use specialized materials to treat them. But you can never use that same conservation methods in the open because climatic conditions are so different that you cannot use the same thing. So the whole process is very, very different. Now, I have a, also a problem with this word scientific archaeology because, for example, it deals with objects, monuments, and sites. Now, all these are imbibed with values, various values, you know, except for the, apart from the standard values like archaeology, history, visual surprise, enjoyment, and so on and so forth, functional, economic, political, uh, visual surprise, and so on. There is also uh, something to me which is much more important is the intangible symbolic value. Mm -hmm. Now, archaeology, however scientific you may call it, is an absolutely destructive process. It destroys all during excavations, and it is impossible to replicate that lost symbolic value in any conservation or whatever you might try to do. It is almost impossible to, to listen. Now, the symbolic value for me is a ritual value that was exercised in its creation. It is better preserved in the ground under the conditions enjoyed by the artifacts from time immemorial. Now, for example, if you look at archeological museums, I'll, I'll go slightly outside Sri Lanka because I, I think the whole thing applies to everything, all the museums actually. An, archeolog an archeological museum should have a context. And one of the best examples to me is the Lingtong district uh, came from the Lingtong district in Xi'an which was discovered in 1974 
it has been regarded as the most significant discovery in the 21st century. The exquisite life-size terracotta army made up of a collection of uh, figures of sculptures depicting the armies of the first emperor of China. This is a form of funerary art buried with the emperor and so on, and to protect the emperor in his lifetime, in his, sorry, in his afterlife. It's all intact, it's in, two, in situ. Large areas that remain unexcavated may be excavated in the future when technology improves or may be designated to remain in the ground forever. That's, that's, a, that's something that the Chinese have to decide. The design of the covering is such that visitor intervention is minimal. It was designated the World Heritage Site in 1987. Another intervention that may be regarded as special is the Grotto di Lasco, a cave containing one of the most outstanding displays of prehistoric art yet discovered. The cave was discovered by 14 age boys in 1940 and was first studied by the French archaeologist Andre Bru. Car radiocarbon dating of some of the charcoal has given a date of about 17,000 uh, years, while other specialists are certain that the cave's art is a highly complex accumulation of artistic ex ex uh, episodes spanning a much longer period. And I tend to agree with that. The cave was in perfect condition when first discovered and was open to the public in 1948. The floor level was quickly lowered to accommodate a walkway, ensuring uh, uh, pedestrian traffic. But, and then it was also artificially lit. It caused a huge problem because the colors of the paintings or the drawings started fading and it brought about the growth of algae, bacteria and crystals. A huge amount of crucial archeological information and material was lost in that process. So it cannot be replicated in any way. Thus in 1963, the cave was closed and the growth of crystals was stemmed while algae and bacteria was halted for a moment and reversed, process reversed. In 2001, microorganisms, mushrooms and sorted were noted again in the cave and daily monitoring of conditions continue even today. In 1979, the cave complex was designated a World Heritage Site. But interestingly, in 1983, a partial replica, Luxo II, was opened nearby for public viewing. And the original cave remains open to researchers and scientists working to remove the mold. Now, the people going into Luxo II have, don't realize the difference. And, and they seem to enjoy that quite well. Now take Sri Lanka, for example, the country with a living religion in creating a stupa or a temple, several days of ritual, chanting, offering of, uh, uh, offerings are, uh, are performed and each effort is related to a carefully established auspicious time frame. But when we excavate a stupa that has been ID identified as a religious edifice, but presently not in use. We hurriedly remove the cultural objects and destroy what I was originally talking about, the symbolism, which can never be replaced in the best conservation efforts. And the finds are deposited in the museum. The stupa has no value anymore. It was specifically created to house the relics. So that to me is a very serious problem because if you take the, the relics out or the objects that are enshrined in the stupa out, then the stupa has no value. You can actually destroy the stupa if it is built for that particular purpose. Now, in Sigiriya, I have suggested the creation of an artificial cave shelter complex similar to Luxo uh, at the lower level. That is to preserve the fifth century paintings executed high on the rock surface. The new cave is to be cons uh, cons constructed at a lower level and the paintings to be copied using the latest technology to simulate the original surface of the rock. It's 
the rock is an undulating, undulating process, uh, sort of surface. So that should be reproduced in this whole thing. This would protect the fresco pocket from the effects of condensation and humidity generated by the visitors arriving at the pocket, panting and sweating after the steep climb. So we are opening Sigiria to exactly what happened in Lasco, unless we can protect it. Now, over visitation at Sigiri has been a problem in the recent past. And though this concept was mooted many years ago, the concept of Sigiri Cave 2 remains just a suggestion. Take, for example, Carter and his discovery of the tomb of Tutankhamun. The objects find, found could have been retained at the site, but they would have been subjected to looting by grave robbers. Interestingly, New evidence emanating from the latest research out of Egypt is that the robbing of the tomb was not by unknown robbers outside the system as earlier imagined, but in most cases by representatives of a subsequent pharaoh who needed to extract the wealth entombed in the earlier burials, urgently needed to rebuild the treasury depleted due to wars across the borders. The mummies were re wrapped after the jewelry and other valuables extracted. Now Carter, my original hero, turned out to be a grave robber. He found the entrance to the cave as a hole in the ground and indulged in the systematic looting of the grave. He took the objects out and moved them to a museum. But what was so archaeologically scientific about the process used? What was the uh, process that is happening in Egypt even today? the mad rush to collect the cultural objects of a little understood culture that many engage in, collect the material to feed man's ego yesterday and his superiority complex today. The Portuguese, Dutch, and the British had colonies and so did the French. The French were not innocent parties. From the 16th to the 17th century, the first French colonial empire was the second largest empire behind only the Spanish empire. During the 17, uh, during the 18th and 20th century, the French colonial empire was the second largest colonial empire only behind the British Empire. France established colonies in North America, the Caribbean, and India in rivalry with Britain. Now, one of your famous heroes, Napoleon Bonaparte, also known as Napoleon I, was a French military leader and emperor who conquered much of Europe in the early 19th century. Napoleon's military contest, conquest fueled the vast and unprecedented collection of artworks to establish a universal museum in Paris, the self-proclaimed capital of knowledge and art. The rise and fall of the Napoleonic Louvre fundamentally altered the way Europeans perceived art and heritage inspiring a race to create national museums and sanctioning the colonial plunder of the rest of the world. Now, say, for example, uh, say the French had their colonies in, uh, you know, after Algiers was con uh, conquered in uh, 1830, I think, uh, France began to establish new empires in Africa, South Af Southeast Asia, in the Americas, in Canada, in the South, and in Africa, uh, numer numerous countries in, the, in Africa. Though some countries have been decolonized, only named, they're tightly tied up to a conglomerate of French speaking countries. This is because the French never left. They are still there through their economic stranglehold. These countries lost most of their precious cultural objects to the museum endeavor. The removal of cultural objects is a psychological move to create doubt in the people's mind of the primitiveness of their culture and prepare the ground for racial superiority that placed the Christian white European colonizer at the top of the world order. It is the con uh, con con conversion to Christianity. The ultimate pseudo alleviation of primitiveness was in the learning of the colonizer language. I mean, we all were subject to that. Today, as, the, as the, all the museums in the ex-colonial ex countries have a couple of objects on display, but back of the house, storehouses and warehouses 
are full of a vast array of rich cultural objects they extracted from the colonies. Much has been spoken of repatriation of cultural objects. That is, that it is morally co correct to return to the owner what was what that was stolen. Repatriation is rightly is righting a wrong. It also requires an admission of guilt. But nations and institutions seldom concede wrong. Not returning stolen objects perpetuated colonizational ideas that the colonized people are still primitive. This colonial legacy permitted so many museums in the West to acquire objects in their collections. It also encouraged and grew the illegal trade in cultural objects controlled by big corporations, unscrupulous antique dealers, and even museums. Some, some stolen objects have been returned, but only after extensive and very expens expensive litigation. Of course, some small trinkets have been returned, similar to the glass beads used in some early barter transactions. The anti-return group is worried that the museums would be empty if cultural objects are returned. These museums provided easy access to their visitors and boosted their tourism industry and income through tourism. In contrast, the heirs to the tradition could not even afford to travel. Further, the anti-return group maintains that the original kingdoms no longer exist. True, we accept that. The arbitrary lines drawn across the land ensuring a process that bifurcated tribes and created artificial divisional boundaries that demarcated many of the colonial countries, especially in, in Africa, created this breakup of the kingdoms. In addition to having easy access to the many museums in their own countries, tourists from the rich West are encouraged to in, indulge in a concept called cultural tourism, an idea sold by funding agencies to the poorer nations as a, positive, as a positive natural development of a new additional income through tourism, a process that further exposes a culture. By penetrating less known and even inaccessible sensitive cultures, this new group, encouraged by colorful books on style, continue to rob these countries by collecting their precious ritual objects that represent their unique culture a process that started in the 19th century. After their adventure, the collections are brought back and laid out in their living spaces as, as art objects. They are but spoils of their conquest. The robbing of cultural objects reinforces the colonial nature of this enterprise called cultural tourism. The UN recently introduced a bill that called the global reaction against racism and discrimination, I think you all all know about it, of the, of the people who voted, only 100 voted yes, the USA, UK, Australia, Canada, Israel, France, Germany, Netherlands said no, and the rest of Europe abstained. These very countries constantly call out to other countries on human rights and freedom. How hypocritical is that? Does one on, honestly believe that the countries unwilling to admit that uh, that devastation affected and the morality of the colonial intervention was wrong, will be willing to fall in line. Colonialism ensured that the rest of the world was willing to, uh, was willfully kept poor by sacrificing their resources to make and keep the West rich. It was pure greed that drove the wealth transfer. The development and the lifestyles of Europe in that Europe life enjoys today is built on the lifeblood sucked out of the colonies without any compensation paid. If not for the wealth taken out from the colonies, the tribes, I'm talking about the tribes of Europe, would have, would have fought and killed each other by now. Does one think that countries unwilling to sign a simple UN bill against racism and discrimination would be willing to return any of the objects they pillaged, plundered, I say taken, to use a better word for wrong, forcibly acquired back to any other countries they belong to, even though they exist in their museums, I cannot see that happen. I cannot see the Tara in the British Museum ever coming home 
A thousand excuses will be made to contest this history and ensure that it does not move out of London. The Greek Prime Minister uh, Mitsotakis wishes that the Parthenon marble be returned, but he must make a logical argument for the restitution of the Parthenon marbles. He must convince the British Museum that, that this would be a historic exception, not a trend. Now, recently, the UN passed a resolution on the return and restitution of cultural property to the countries of origin. Uh, it was supported by 100 and 111 countries, I think. But the new president of the British Museum hinted that they may lend the Parthenon marbles to Greece. But these were, these were looted by Lord Elgin. It was not given to Britain. How can you loan what you did not legally own? The SS Indus set sail from Kolkata in 1985. On board was a little known treasure trove, a collection of third century BC Barut sculptures put together by none other than the first head of the Archaeological Survey of India, Sir Alexander Cunningham. The Barut sculptures unearthed by Cunningham from a Buddhist monastery in Madhya Pradesh were en route to London for an exhibition. It's a, it was a pseudo exhibition of no return. The ship sank off the coast of Sri Lanka and its treasure was lost forever to the world. Now, say for example, hundreds of Candian swords were collected during the uprising against the Britishers. The more powerful British guns reinforced the genocide that killed thousands of innocent villagers and destroyed their villagers and livelihoods. These swords that belong to the grave Sri Lankan, brave Sri Lankan villagers who fought to protect their land lie in the warehouses of the VANA in London today. I have seen them. These are some of the swords that Percy Moore Bingham studied and compared against the steel of the Wilkins, famous Wilkinson sword. His findings was that the steel used in the manufacture of the Candian swords is superior to the Wilkinson sword. This study is recorded in a paper he presented and published uh, that was published by the Institute of Engineers in the 1900s. Suppose these precious objects and ritual artifacts collected, even though more than any museum's requirements selfishly retained, are not coming home. In that case, every museum is duty bound to explore using digital technologies and great storytelling to reveal the history, to enhance the visitor experience that could be shared internationally. The Deutsche Digitale Bibliothek, that's the German digital library, has launched collections from colonial contexts. An online portal in German and English, collections from the colonial context of 25 pilot institutions are now available online. The plan is to expand the portal from this preliminary prototype into a central comprehensive publishing platform for information on collections from colonial contexts at German cultural and knowledge institutions. Currently, the portal has around 8,000 records of collections from colonial contexts. In addition, all colonial museums should employ young researchers from the countries concerned to use computer platforms to document every piece caref carefully in detail and upload the material onto an open access site so that countries that forfeited them will at least be able to see them and be proud of what they had and lost to the most horrible and demeaning of man's enterprises colonialization. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you. Thank you very much, Ashley, for this very detailed information on how, uh, how it, uh, it, the process has been evolving here in Sri Lanka and, uh, and the, the steps um, that were taking in the archaeological field. Um, we'll go straight to the second presentation with uh, Catherine Barra. I leave it over to you now. Thank you. 
Good morning, so everybody, and good afternoon for people who are far away from France. <laughs> um, maybe first of all, I can explain what is called a preventive archaeology, which is a professional field in which I work nowadays. French National Institute of Preventive Archaeological Research was created in 2002 as a public company of professionals able to respond quickly and effectively upstream of land development projects. Today, and despite of legislation who, um, oh, of sorry, which is to reduce competition between the institute and private companies, in that count around 2,000 archaeologists, technicians, specialists, and operation managers, supported by an administrative, organizational, and documentary secretariat. One of our four tasks conferred on the Institute by a French state is passing on results of our research, both to the public and scientific community. What precise forms does take this task? How does it link with museums, with museology? How giving back to public explanation about discoveries and studies in archeological heritage can meet sensitive topics and provide distance and answer. The heart of the Institute's activities is the site where archeological operations are carried out. Preventive archeology span takes place in a defined, constrained and limited time. The aim being the study of the site before it will be given back to development planners to carry out their projects. From there, will come all elements of knowledge of the past, which will be analyzed, and it is yet there that will put in place first transmission to the public. During digging time, an informative scientific signage is putting on an an open day often organized. So can I show um, just now or later, Aurelia? Um, if you want to show now, you can show it now. Okay, I can do that, I hope. <laughs> I know, share, share. No. Is it okay or not? Yes, perfect. You can see the picture or not? Yes. I just see myself, so I don't know. <laughs> no, we can so, see it. We can see it. Oh, yeah. oh, sorry. So you can see then uh, around the, um, the right of way of the excavation of part of an urban islet on an old city, several panels. You see one of them um, explaining the archaeological work. The timeline, oh, was too long, <laughs> sorry. Wow, a timeline, so remember different historical periods and Three small panels explain the site's interest. In the heart of the town, the archaeological operation aroused the curiosity of the neighboring residents and the open day got a nice success. I can stop share. All right, okay. Proximity of dynamic museums, as for instance in Latte near Montpellier, 
allow to consider the creation of a future exhibition from the beginning of the digging project with the archaeologists who gave panels on the site news. After the operation, when the site gives way to a building or motorway, there remain several possibilities to highlight discoveries done by participation and creation of exhibitions. It does exist in the headquarters of the Institute, an office called DDCC, Cultural Development and Communication Direction, which includes a position dedicated to museology and ordered several exhibitions made up of panels called archaeo capsules installed in various place, places. Among the chosen themes, we know the ones of migrations, of slavery, of the colonial era, which are today at the heart of the topics of debate in the world and has been documented by archaeological digs. And so I will share again my screen. Five, not two, three. Okay. Is it okay for, for you? We don't see your screen. Sorry. So maybe I did not do. Partager. Selection. Voilà. You see it now? Yes. Yes, we see it. Uh, okay. The ambition of these funky exhibitions is to allow, thanks to archaeology, to take a step back, trigger a new imaginary, and take a different look at the present beyond postures and pensives, as said by Françoise Vergès and Daniel Bego in a publication on segregation's remains. So. It's all. Yes. And something else. French overseas territories are more sensitive to identity issues, their inhabitants being mainly from ancestors who were victims of colonialism and slavery during previous centuries. Until such research, this genealogy didn't seem to be worthy of pride reflect of the unearthed past by archaeology particular approach so materiality of this brought to light remains. Discovery of the past of the place where people live facilitates the, the identification because it shows and gives value, make unique and precious Humble, often broken remains, which were involved in day life and in gestures surrounding the deceased, ordinary and anonymous persons, but becoming important by their new time traveler status, telling a story, their story, the history deciphered by researchers. Even history of people we current residents are not genetically related to become as a part of our is only history, sorry, but because we share the same land. And maybe for Caribbean people, as you say on the slide, uh, it's a slide of a uh, archaeological museum of Guadeloupe, for Caribbean people because of their tragical destiny also due to colonialism. So, up, stop it. Archaeologists 
working for French state who gives orders to realize preventive operations, just meet um, Myers in Martinique. And this uh, operation is very fruitful. Myers of village are now demanding for operation on the uh, archeological operations on their territories. For the reason said, valuation of places which reveals an history everyone can be proud of. For metropolitan area, I will present example, two examples, migrations and Muslim medieval prisons in Europe and particularly in Provence. These years, many exhibitions present Islam culture. Beautiful objects are good mediators as humble pieces from archaeological fields. Hopefully, uh, research on this theme with an archaeological view supported by materiality and uh, visibility of scientific method uh, became 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 causing colloquium PhD thesis publication exhibitions. I will uh, I will tell about uh, thesis work realized by an archaeological an archaeologist and ceramologue um, Catherine Richarté, who studied material from uh, subaquatic uh, um, dig and over four wrecks, four Islamic wrecks found the uh, um, just uh, close um, French uh, coast and uh, discovered uh, how they lived be with the help of uh, objects found uh, in board. On migration issues, archaeologists view involved human behaviors for millenniums. What can relativize present migrations? And I uh, will conclude with um, Mark uh, Antoine Kaiser's words from um, Switzerland Archaeological Museum, who wrote uh, the object's value is not uh, didactic, no uh, simply aesthetic, it is also symbolic. Even uh, objects uh, more without uh, any use uh, to uh, um, archaeological uh, knowledge are effectively uh, um, uh, with a dignity, which is the one of the, our ancestors' heritage. So, thank you. And <laughs> thank you. <laughs> um, thank you for the, this presentation and on the, the perspective of the INRAP and the, the mediation practices that, that can be also imagined on the excavation sites directly. Um, I'm going to go directly to the third presentation with uh, Jagat Virasinger. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Aurelia. And um, well, um, I will first tell you what I'm not going to do. Um, my talk will uh, will try to enter the problem, uh, the contested histories directly. And in doing that, I I wouldn't address uh, those really large issues as uh, Ashley directed us to the repatriation of artifacts. I won't address that or the problem of over visitation or the intangible value of, uh, of artifacts. These are really seriously important um, aspects in, in, in to be considered uh, in installing museum exhibition, but that's not what I'm going to do. I'm going to be directly focusing on just one issue. That's what uh, that is. Uh, what and whose history do we present in archeological museums? Taking the examples of my own or our own because I'm 
the director of archaeology at Sigiriya, the Sigiriya Museum. So any critique I make here is also applicable to, to, to me. And I can see Ashley is already smiling at that and also taking Polonar work. Um, and I, what I'm saying has to be taken with a, uh, with a certain, uh, with a glance fixed on the current political conditions, the idea of the nation and nationalism in this country. So, uh, and in order to do this, I like to draw everyone's attention to this idea of archaeologists because we are doing, I'm an archaeologist, I've been the director of the Postgraduate Institute of Archaeology. So once again, everything I say is also applicable to me. I'm not Mr. Clean coming out of these problems, but I'm part of the problem. I'm very well aware of that. I'm a government servant. So in this country or <laughs> everywhere else, there's a deep embedded self-deception among most archaeologists and and Ashley kind of uh, implied on that and I'm going to work on that idea uh, and this is a deception that is shared by especially in, in erstwhile colonies like Sri Lanka and India um, like you know in places like this it's also shared by the general public uh, and it is being highly promoted by populist media. The deception is that archeological truth claims of the past, archeological truth claims of the past is more valid or more scientific than the other forms of truth claims of the past. What I mean by that is, is that as for me, um, I'm interested in museums, archaeology, and also what we call epistemology, um, the production of knowledge. So when you look at archaeology as a process of producing knowledge about the past, I don't know why we should give more validity to archaeological truth claims about the past than for historical or anthropological, for that matter. But the reason why I pick on archaeology, history, and anthropology, and put them on the same line for Sri Lankans, for, Indian, for Indians, for Bangladeshis, for Pakistanis. These are the three disciplines. These are the three core disciplines that constitute or that, that, that defined the idea of, of the past and the nationhood. The way we think of the nation today, uh, the idea of the national is actually defined by this and the other, the fourth subject is fine arts. What is interesting is, if you don't get, uh, if Ashley doesn't get in, get in uh, into an argument with me, in the, the idea of art is also a colonial product. Forgive me, I'm I'm saying that with from a very particular uh, positioning myself in a very particular uh, line of knowledge production. I'm not so like a, I'm a modern artist. In as Aurelia in, introduced me, I'm an artist and. Uh, I'm an artist because I think of art and doing art and of myself in a particular way, and which, which is not shareable with the people who built, uh, created those artworks in Anuradhapura or Polnaruva. I'm a modern, modern product. Anyway, so my first argument is, why do you think archaeological truths are more important than sociological truths of a place, or an anthropological truths of a place, or historical truths of a place? When we when we talk of Sigiriya or Polnaru or Anuradhapura, there are, we always, we work with three minimum, there are so many past, minimum three past, no? The historical past, the archeological past and the anthropological past. And because the historical past, hist the historical history or the historical past of Sigiriya is not exactly the archeological past of, of Sigiriya. Sigiriya is this fifth century royal palace. So, so let's think of, of Sigiriya or a field or site museum. So we have an archaeological site. So Sigiriya is an archaeological site. Polonnaruwa, an archaeological site. At bo in both these places, we have what we call site museums. Or for this discussion, we would call it site archaeological museums. And they present them. They present themselves to its visitors as the truth, more ordered truth about the path of the site, and keeping in line with the with the with the 
topic of our discussion today. This is exactly what I try, try to interrogate or to not really to engage with it. Because you know, all these museums are structured in a particular way. They have an axial structuring. It has one axis and its depth factor, um, this is also an architect's problem actually, the depth factor in designing this museum is very narrow, very limiting. So it is also already designed from an architectural point of view, from an architect's point of view, to, to tell the story in a particular way, in a direct way, in an axial way. But this is not a problem as such, but it could, but it, it is limiting certain stories to be told in the museum. At Sigiriya Site Museum and at Polnaruwa too, the curators have attempted to, to negotiate with this structuring by giving us a wider archaeological um, context for Sigiriya and for, for Polnaro. And I'll show you a few images from, uh, from Sigiriya Museum and try to tell you what I mean by this. Okay. This you can call the entrance lounge to the Sigiriya Museum. And if you look at this wonderful, you know, really interesting uh, panel here, it presents Sigiriya here and also these other lighted points are the other archeological sites around Sigiriya. And as you enter this museum is telling you the archeological context, uh, its relationship to other sites in the, in the area. And then when you enter, you enter the prehistory of Sigiriya, which is very interesting. So, and then it, 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 it's an axis, you walk through an axis and then you go to these burials, prehistoric or, um, or, or proto-historic burials found around Sigiriya. This is still not the, the popular idea, of, it has nothing to do with the popular idea of Sigiriya. So the, the archeologist, who worked as the curator is telling a particular kind of, of story uh, by showing all this, taking you through. So it, it is the historical depth of Sigiriya goes far beyond the popular story of, of Sigiriya, which, is, which begins only at the fifth century. And then we come to the iron technological, uh, iron technological site um, that is near in the vicinity of, of Sigiriya. And then we have this Buddhist uh, archeological uh, finds from the sites around Sigiriya. These are not from Sigiriya, the popular site, though the World Heritage site, but from around there. And that's all I'm going to show you. So with this, so the archeologists have to take you through <coughs> the particular uh, history of archeology span a context of archaeology, it contextualizes Sigiriya within an archaeological history. This is my point. Because to begin the discussion, I said there are other histories, but it is not that history which is being presented here. It is this particular history. And at Polonaru, because at, but one can contest this idea. I'll stop sharing now. But one can contest this idea, um, the idea, because the con I mean, contest, if the complexity of the idea of Sigiriya or at Polnaru, is it presented here? That is that because as a historical, archaeological or anthropological entity, it's not here, it's only archaeological history of the site, which if you bring in the idea of contesting it, this is a point that you can contest because these are, these are the issues that I keep wondering about my museum. How does the processes or the ways of experiencing the site is recorded or enacted in the museum? Question one, is that a valid, uh, valid question to raise? Or should, should the site museum be just a background or a backdrop to the site that in it, that initiate the visitor to the complexity of the site, which he has to find it on his own, own way. So we give the, before going to Sigiriya 
for the Polar Narva, you have the Seagiri Museum, which gives you this whole archaeological depth of Seagiri and its complex image of Seagiri. It's not the history of Seagiri. History of Seagiri is a bit different. According to history of Seagiri, Kashapa, the parricidal king, I mean, who, he killed his father, and he left on Radhapura and he came here and, you know, we ruled here for 17 or 11 years, 17 years or so, because he was scared of his brother. And he had this he had guilty consciousness. But archaeological, that's not the story we get. You know, archaeological Sigiri has been an urban center. It had lapis lazuli brought from, from Badakhshan. You know, it was the only non-historical deposit of that beautiful blue color was in Badakhshan. It came to Rome and other places from, which is above Afghanistan. And then there are Roman coins, the Sasanian pottery. That means Sigiriya was, Kashyap was not hiding there. So that is the archaeological history. But the popular, uh, popular history of, uh, of, of Sigiriya is not that. So the practical past of Sigiriya that people believe or people want to remember or to recite is different than uh, but we have found archaeologically. And, and then, so my question is, for our discussion today is, what should a uh, site museum do then? Should it present that complexity of its archaeological story and let the uh, visitors find it, find the other histories on their own? Or can we contribute to that? Uh, well, I say, because, and if you walk into the Sigiri villages, and you speak to Sigiri people who have been living there for, you know, these are traditional villages who were transformed into native informants with the colonial intrusions into these sites. You know, they were villagers, they were natives, they were made native informants. They become native informants because of us, because of us means we the archaeologists the explorers who went there and took there. So anyway, so uh, according to Sigiri villagers, the story of Kashyap has, has different uh, bends or high points. Not exactly the high point that is given at Mahavamsa or the, I mean, the ancient history book. And then for some people, for some, according to some stories, Sigiri begins, has a longer history than Kashyap for them. A royal history that begins in the third century AD, not fifth century. So Kashyapa history is fifth century. And there's another royal history for them for Sigiri region that is third century. It is not archaeologically uh, established history, but this is the history that they live with. And then there is a modern history, there is a modern myth built around it. It's like the Ravana, this, this mythical thing. So as, as the director of archaeology, who is responsible for, if it becomes necessary to redesign the Sigiri Museum, what should I do? What history, whose history should I be telling? How can I make Sigiri more interesting that so people will come and they can relate to it? And then Sigiri has another history, which actually we did show is the history of archaeology in Sigiri. To be early on, if you look at the early stamps or early images of Sigiri, we looked at Sigiri from a from its, from another side, not from the side that we are uh, reproducing today. We reproduce Sigiri from its western side. It was always reproduced as east from the eastern side over the lake, early on, early 20th century. So, so the changing of the way that we think of Sigiri is the work of art history and work of archaeology. So, what what I am saying is that. We have a re really interesting pro uh, problem here. To whom are we making this, uh, this museum? This is for the archeologists and the enlightened people from, from, from the metropolis, or the local or the European metropolis, or for the common folks. The common folks will always retain their practical story about Sigiriya. And that, with that, I, I stopped talking. Thank you. Thank you very much. These good, give very good questions for the discussion in the second part. So I hope we'll, we'll have the opportunity to, to delve into them. Um, first, we'll go straight to the last presentation with uh, Sophie Delpierre. 
I leave the floor to you. Thank you very much, Aurelia. Do you see my screen? Yes. Do you see incomplete? Uh -huh. Yes. I guess. It's a large one. Yes. Yes. OK. So uh, yes, indeed, I agree. Uh, extremely good um, question. I'm eager to have the discussion for now. My duty is to do my presentation. So um, first of all, thank you very much uh, um, to the uh, Ambassade de France, au Sri Lanka et au Maldives. Uh, I say it in French, so merci beaucoup. And I will obviously pursue in English. Uh, thank you very much for your, for your invitation. From uh, the, all the seminar you made, I, uh, I'm, I'm happy to be part of this one. And from the introduction you gave to, the, to, this, uh, to this webinar, I pick one question because for me, it's certainly the one where I, I think I can share a little bit uh, and cover what ICOM, the International Council of Museums, do on this question that you ask. And so the title of my presentation, I pick your, your, your question, can museums play a role in the fight against illicit trafficking of cultural goods? And I know it's not usual, but I will give the answer directly to you. Yes, and a big role at international level. But let me explain in a few minutes uh, what we do exactly. So first of all, for the person who are not aware of who uh, ICOM is, and before I begin to explain what we do, it's, uh, it's necessary to know who we are. So the International Council of Museums is a non-governmental organization. And I insist on the non because it's important in the, in the profile we have in the international fights against illicit trafficking. We have been created the same year as UNESCO. It's easy to retain, 1946. So we are celebrating this year as UNESCO our 75th anniversary. So it's really an important year for us. And the membership, because we are the International Council of Museums, obviously the membership is open to institution, of course, but also to individuals. And that is very important. So where are we and who are we? Who I explain, we are the museum professionals and institutions. And we are now since um, 75 years, uh, nearly everywhere in the world. So we are nearly 50,000, if I optimist, you have an optimist number. We have, and it's important, and I will explain you why in all, in, all the time in my presentation, we are present in the 140 countries, but we have 118 national committees. And we have ICOM uh, Sri Lanka, I have to say it. And the point is, it means that at national level, we have an institution that gather the professional who want to join us. And our main channel of communication from our work at international to the national person, the professional is in country, we have this channel, which is our national committee. And that is extremely, extremely important because it helps us to, to, to make operational activities, operational tools. And that is fundamental for ICOM. And then that is, I mean, at national level, but then we have also, um, and it might answer a little bit the question heard before, we have also international committees. And these com this committees, 32, are gathering people from the same, same interest, let's say like this. And so we have, in, we have for example, interest regarding a specification in museum Topic, for example, um, we can have uh, the biggest one is ICOM CC, which deal with conservation. So all people who are really, for example, specific in conservation of glass or on paper, gather from any country and they speak together. And I, I can tell you that the exchange of information of best practices is amazing. And from my heard or so, I just picked two. I, I would like to underline the, wor the, 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 the work made by ICOM SECA, which is the one who is um, dealing with education and cultural action. 
So for the discussion, it might be interesting, but also ICMA. And ICMA is specialization of collection of archaeology. So for the question that we heard a little bit before, and exchange the information, how we, dim, how we show collection of archaeology, collection from the archaeological sites, how we communicate with our public, schools, visitors, tourists, such questions are not specific to one country. There are many, I mean, nearly all countries in the world deal with the same question. So having a platform when, when, where museum people can meet, speak about this problematic and have answers is for me, I, I feel all the time really, really uh, astonished, but in the good way about how this information can be discussed and dialogue and say the problematic of a country is not a problematic on another one. So for me, it's this platform to say, hey, you are the same job than me. And I can see that in your country you have the same problematic is very something that can enrich the, the dialogue. And um, so I think these two committee and probably more than these two can be really helpful for museum people in our country. So um, just I'm not sure to, to do the publicity of ICOM, but it's important to know that when you are part of ICOM, you are part of a network, of course, and you can have access to publication, to conferences, to training. You can be also contacted, for, for example, from my department to help uh, to create tools for heritage protection. And I stop here regarding ICOM in general because my topic today is to speak about heritage protection and more specifically on illicit trafficking. Regarding, I will not speak about restitution, but I'm open to open to speak about it um, during the discussion, of course. But given the time, I focused on illicit traffic. So why the museums and, of course, ICOM are working to fight illicit trafficking of cultural goods? And I can tell you that it's not new. I have archives from the 70s, 60s, previous century about People in ICOM already uh, thinking about what we do with acquisition, what we do with provenance, what about ethics in the acquisition. All these topics are already studied for many, many years in ICOM. So for the, for the why, I can tell you, well, it, it should be logical. If you are a museum curator, if a museum person, a museum, a person from culture, you eager to protect this culture to give to the next generation. So my question has a simple answer, but I will give you another answer. Museums are also victims of theft. It's not the majority of the traffic, but still. And I took some statistics for the last report of Interpol, and you can see on the yellow um, arrow that in Asia and South Africa and South Pacific, please take these statistics with really a lot of, of uh, precautions because they are only statistics. But you can see that the percentage of theft regular cultural goods are coming from museums. But what is interesting also from our conversation today is the statistics next to the museum. 26% of theft are from archaeological sites. So it can be also a good argument in our conversation today. So together, it means that one third of theft regarding cultural heritage in this region of the world is from our museum or archaeological sites. So it's really important that every person from the government, from the non-government non organization, from the police, from the customs need to engage in this fight because see how it can be important. Another um, part that I will have enough time to go deep, but please, I really want you to know that also it's not on the first article in the press release all the time, but behind at the international level, I can tell you that behind the police specialized forces, behind the, the customs, um, and, and France and is specialized for that. Um, there is, there are museum professionals that, that help the, leg, the uh, legal enforcement agency, such as police, such as customs, to authenticate, to, um, to help the policeman and the custom officer to, to, to check the object, give opinion, 
call a colleague in another country to say, here, I have something, can you help? Because the police ask me your advice on it. So I really would like to, under, to underline the work made by the museum behind the doors when uh, about the circulation of objects, when it's beginning in the process of being studied by a law enforcement agencies. That is in general, but I come, we develop several tools also for heritage protection. Sorry, I will go really quickly because of the time, but please note that for each of them, I generally give one hour presentation. Um, first of all, um, because I heard maybe things that are not completely correct in the previous presentation regarding, for example, acquisition. Since we have an ethics, we have a code for museum professional in Alcom since the 80s. And since the 80s, it is clear that museums need to check provenance regarding acquisition. They need to have validated for acquisition. They need to do provenance and due diligence when acquiring because museums are part of the circulation of objects. And so they, have com they are completely knowing about the situation. But let's be honest, some of museums in the world do not play the game and do have a bad behavior that me, I com completely do not uh, agree, of course. And because of some of them, you know, we have the reputation for all the museum community. But please note that from the years I'm working on this topic, I can tell you that the vast majority of museums are completely clear with the acquisition, the, the policy of acquisition they have. But on some topic, and it's true, and decolonization, please note, it's a topic discussed deeply in ICOM for many years, and it's on the table, nothing right. It's clear on the table, discussed between professionals from every country in the world. And that is another topic, of course. But please note that the traffic is from the past and from the present, and we are fighting for the future. So it's uh, something that we have to deal at every part of the time. And today we have to take some action to avoid the traffic that exists today. So at ICOM, because our international position, we are working with international partners. Of course, UNESCO and the 1970 Convention Secretariat and the 1954 Convention Secretariat, which is for more for armed conflict. I, I heard also, um, uh, Madame Barra speaking about underwater. So we are working with the 2001 Convention Secretariat because yes, everything is linked. So for us, uh, working with UNESCO is of course absolutely logical. We are working, as I told you, because of the police and the custom and the extremely important role they have. We are working with Interpol and the World Custom Organization. And it's important also to know that um, even Sri Lanka is part of the 1970 convention. This convention worked with another convention, which is the UNIDWA 1995 convention that Sri Lanka is not part of. And um, it's important because these two convention is really the, the main axis for international cooperation. And on, on this axis and solid um, ground, we can build our program to fight illicit traffic. And that, and that is all together that we have something efficient, in fact. Well, to, to speak a few minutes about the tools that we have. First tool we have is the object ID. Object ID is like a standard to describe objects. Of course, museums have, have their inventories. Of course, I said they should have their inventories complete, up to date. But I can tell you that in every country in the world, and I insist, every country in the world, inventories are problematic. And we don't condemn that, but we encourage to do better. And to do better, we, we have to, 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 to help our museums. So we have also the, the really, really good expertise of another international committee, which is CDOC and specialist in documentation. And they gave really sometimes really high level tools. But I also hear 
from my trainings and conference countries who said, well, we don't have the means for all digitization you speak about. So that's why ICOM has also really simple, simple, simple tools such as object ID, which is just a norm to say how you have to describe an object to be sure that it's the same language for another country. For example, if you describe with object ID collection in Sri Lanka, if tomorrow there is a problem, theft or vandalism or whatever, what an accident, and there is a traffic on the object that have been described like this, and when you will say it to the police, then in the police, I can tell you that it's a register in the same criteria because we are pushing for this standardization. It means that it will go in the database. And if it's going in the database, you push the luck to find the object one day. I don't say you will, because there is always possibility that we'll never have it, but you will push the luck to have it back. So again, I don't want to be too far to describe it. That is really easy to use. I, I uh, one month ago, I made a class for uh, uh, um, with our colleague from UNESCO Dakar for all the region. And it was in French, obviously. It was a one hour just on object ID to show to the museum people how they can easily, but really easily use such tool. And yes, it is still, even if we are pushing this tool since the 90s, it's, it is still important because uh, Interpol uh, just a few months ago launched their new app, free app, uh, about to, to, to consult the database they have on stolen work about object and how they use, how they, they, they construct the app, they construct the app with um, uh, criteria and what they use for criteria, they use object ID. So it's really, really to show you that it's still something that you can use with paper and pencil and, uh, and gather in a part of the museum or something that can be used even for uh, computers. The second tool and maybe the most known one, it's the ICOM Red List. Because as you saw, there are some theft in a museum. In this case, we expect inventories. So expect the information going to the police in the best case, of course. But as you saw, there are also more than 20% from archaeological sites. And then you can say, well, thank you, I come. But if they are on archaeological site, they are obviously not inventoried. That seems logical for anybody. But still, we know about this traffic. And we know, so, so since the since year 2000, I just finished the 18 red list. Since, the, since 20 years now, we are preparing such red list, which is like flyers. And inside the red list that is for a country or region, we are working with experts from the country or the region to explain and show objects that are not stolen, but look like objects that are circulating. Like that, we can say to police in another country or another part of the world, hey, careful because this country or this region say that this kind of object is circulating. And this country tell you that it is protected in the country. So be careful. If you find this kind of object, careful because it is protected. So somebody is traveling with it. He has to have all the papers, et cetera, et cetera. So, it's what I come can do, what I come can bring at international level, its own capacity, its capacity to say to any policeman or any custom officer that are obviously not art historian, it's normal, it's not the job, but we give them tool to say, if you go see, if you go to see that, I can show you, for example, one here, which is for Latin America, it's kind of objects that look like and that are in circulation. And we have many examples of um, objects that have been seized and studied like that. Here is an example. It's big, big like this one because it's really clear. You can see it was the Chinese cultural objects red list. And it was uh, an information received by police in Argentina and said to Interpol and Interpol said to us. So they found some um, bells. 
uh, bronze bells. And they, they, they check in the red list, oh, and it seems like an object is looking. So they begin investigation, and at the end, they saw that the object was traveling without normal uh, documentation. So it was um, taken back. And same for the head here, and head of Buddha, that have been uh, look like, again, it's like something in the red list that look like, because of course, all the objects in the red list are not stolen, as I told you. They are example of vulnerable objects. All of them are in museum. We have the copyright to use it. Um, but it's help can, uh, police, custom, and even auction house, and even museum, because the idea is not to stop circulation of objects, is to say it, have to, it can travel, but it has to be authorized. Otherwise, we are against this circulation. So I stop here because I think I already, oh yeah, sorry. I was already too long, sorry, Aurelia. Um, but uh, here is a glimpse of what ICOM is doing for heritage protection. Of course, I am available for discussion, for conversation, for even not easy question. I'm really happy to be here also to hear them. Um, but please note that it's really, in the art of ICOM to be part, to be to be generous in the efforts to help with the with the fight against illicit traffic, because for us and for every museum in the world, this is really um, something that we want to fight deeply um, and with all the well all the forces we have, because for the for our duty as museum professional that to protect heritage for the next generation in its context with its history as spoke by the previous um, uh, panelists. Well, we need to, an object circulating without context for me is like a lost object. So let's avoid that. Let's make all we can to avoid that at every level. And I can tell you that at every level, every from the archeologist to the museum curator, to the mediator, to the ministries, to the police, to the customs, everybody has a role to play, everybody. So it's really important that we work together and I finish it and thank you, thank you for invitation and for having me today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sophie, for this uh, uh, excellent presentation that also opens up a global perspective on the topic that we're, we're discussing uh, today. And uh, briefly, because we only have 10 minutes left, uh, to talk uh, a bit on the narrative of the site itself and on the presentation of the, the collections itself. Um, so we can have a question of uh, Sujata Migama on the, how would technology enable uh, archaeologists to present a more layered historical narrative of the site? Um, is this a question that you've already been experiencing in, in, in your own uh, presentation yes. at the Siberia Museum? Um, yeah, this is one thing that we can actually use to present the other stories of Sigiria, or the people's stories of Sigiria. I'll give you one good example. I was I was meaning to mention this. Like I say, if you if you visit Polonnaruwa from today, taking the main entrance, you enter. On your left hand side, you get the Shiva Devala. On your right hand side, you have the inner citadel, the royal area. And if you think how the royal people, the royals of of the Polonnaruwa period experienced the site, they come out from the gate of the citadel, the first thing they see is, is the Shiva Devala. And then on our upper terrace, the quadrangle with Buddhist items. So even today, our experiencing of, of Polonnaruwa, the archaeological site, begins with, a, with the presence of a Shiva Devala. But the museum doesn't say that. As, museum experience is a very different experience. It's more Buddhist to begin with and then becomes Hindu. I'm not asking to change it, but I think like, you know, I'm trying to I expect from this committee, what is a site museum? What does it do? What is it? Because it is on my shoulders now to redesign them, you know, come up with proposals if I think it is problematic. Because see, Polonaro Museum is not replicating the Polonaro site as such in terms of its the way you experience it. But of course, it does tell you the story, complex story of Sigiria. But it, sorry, of, of Polonaro. 
but you know, but it has you know separate section, so to speak, or the Buddhist, Hindu, and all that. But the but the Polonaro site is not like that. It is Shivadevala are interposed. It's everywhere, like you know, it is it's at the same, it's yeah, it's not separated as such, the two religions. So for me, as a, a contemporary Sri Lankan, looking at our current political problem, Polonarua, the archaeological site presents a way to think about our uh, the idea of the nation, so to speak. So can the can the museum contribute to that idea, which I call a, a, a reconciliatory idea? I know these are very tough questions. I don't want to simplify them, but I. Uh, but even the digital digitize digitizing technologies can help us in these things. Anyway, I'll stop there. I'm curious to see if uh, the other panelists have a thought on uh, on this question on how to present uh, complex history on the presentation of the collection. Well, hi, I have, if I if I can. Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, no, it's a, it's a, it's a really important question because especially as generally. We are not always the museum sites, and we don't have the archaeological sites next to the museum. It's not always the case. And even if we have the, the, the archaeological sites next to the museum, it's not always open to public. So your question that you raised during your presentation is extremely interesting. And what is even more interesting is, personally, I don't know your site, but I heard exactly the same questioning from other curator or other conservator or other experts from museum in another country, where the, the history is of course not the same, but at the end, it's always a difficult story. I, I heard the same conversation with, for example, with some sites in Bolivia or some sites in Poland, or on site that um, especially because of a political revolution or a, a change of, of politics or change of borders, um, but also on sites where they know they have armed conflict. So, you know, they can have difficulties to present a collection in, in, uh, in countries for many reasons, but at the end, the question is the same and it's difficult to present the collection and the history. And that's why I said that is really important to be able to to speak to a colleague that is not from the country, but has exactly the same problematics. And to answer for the technological aspect, let's say that from what I heard, sometimes it can help because it can give context through digital machine, um, screen, a video, interview, presenting in the museum, but it's not the solution. It can be anything else. It can be so digital is a tool, but it will not bring, of course, the solution, but that you know already what I'm saying. But, but that is to answer the question. But regarding the difficulties to present a difficult collection, wherever the difficulty is coming from, it's something that is really, really in discuss in our organization too, because uh, for, um, especially, for example, when you have to present in child, uh, for children and for schools that arrive in the museum and then you need to explain difficult the stories it's some just to tell you that is something that is really uh, we have dozens of ex of ex best practice of of, of uh, example uh, that could um, that is exactly in the link of what you say so from me the interesting thing is that it's important to study even sometimes outside the museum or so with person from the local communities or from the education, how to deal with this difficult topic. From the person who know the history and sometimes also from person who don't know the history because they have the external eye or so, and that is important. Um, any, any thoughts on this, uh, given your experience in mediation for, for archeological sites? about the problem of uh, how people are, are taking uh, contesting histories and don't want to see them, you mean? 
Sorry, I can't hear you very well. Oh, sorry, uh, again. Uh, you mean uh, about people uh, in countries who don't want to 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 take uh, the contesting histories and want to only see what they want to see? <laughs> Yes, and also how to present uh, complex histories uh, from different backgrounds to have like the archaeological yeah. history, the history itself, the anthropological history. I think um, I, I would present two, two ways. First of all, first of, of them is a uh, um, staging, <laughs> staging of uh, sites and uh, exhibitions. And uh, second is maybe a participative uh, research with people, uh, with local people, ask, uh, ask them to, to show their own objects, their own history, and make them uh, participate to uh, research elaboration and uh, exhibition elaborations. Yes, and it also connects with what uh, Sujata Migama was saying about the, the co-curation that can be done from the community itself. So um, I don't know, Jagat, is something is that you've already experienced in uh, Singaria or not yet? Um, no, it's like, you know, the problem I have at Singaria is uh, most local people are not very much interested in coming to the museum. So that how I, you know, I mean, only some, you know, people from Colombo usually come, they spend time, but not from the villages and all that. Um, so I don't know how, I mean, how to, how to make them, uh, how to excite them to the museum is my, one of my challenges. We have all sorts of drawing programs and playing programs and all that. They spend time there, but the museum as a place to end, uh, See, like the, the reason why we want art history and museums are these are the only two disciplines that allows you to meditate in a space. You go to a museum is a building, it's a protected building, you know, well organized, comfortable, and it, it, it promotes you, it prompts you to stay a while and think. But my clientele is not doing that. So that is my problem. Of course, when Ashley comes to and or my, my student from graduate students come, they spend time. I'm, they are not my real clientele. My real clientele are the, the, the school children and other, other folks coming to. So now we are, I mean, like, you know, Ashley was also in this mission. We were actually trying to make the, force them through the museum. They will um, change the whole uh, walking system, entering system to see area. But uh, yeah, that's one way of like, you know, so they know that there's something called, people go to museums. Of course, you know, students are going to museums because it's mandatory during their school. First term, uh, first term of the year, they are supposed to go to museums. They, they actually run through museums if they are from uh, village schools. But Colombo school kids spend a bit more time. Anyway, this is a different theme, another theme for a different uh, meeting, I guess. Yes, <laughs> we have uh, many opening questions actually. Uh, we discussed uh, so many topics that could uh, could could be the topics of uh, their own conversations, I think. And uh, it only up opens up uh, avenues of, uh, of reflection. Um, if Give me one moment. One thing is like, you know, actually, you know, at one point, I, uh, there was this hair, women's hairstyle called Sigiri hairstyle. Even our former director general and uh, founding director of the Central Cultural Fund, Roland Silva's wife, when I looked at the wedding photo, she's having that hairstyle. And the first uh, multi-color uh, single film in that very uh, the famous actress was having the same hairstyle. I said, like, that is part of his Sigiri legacy. There are more than 30 or 30, 37 popular songs of Sigiri. And Sigiri uh, female images are replicated, redesigned in every junction, everywhere. So I'm wondering, why can't I use these things? To, to make people come in. It's also another way of owning Sigiriya. It's not only in archeologically, but it, through popular culture. So it will come to your table, uh, Ashley, one of these days, my proposal. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, see, 
it's an interesting challenge. Thank you, Zagat. <laughs> Thank you. If um, if nobody else has uh, any anything else to add for now i will be uh, moving on to our conclusion um so thank you to everyone so this is uh, the the final session of our program rethinking museums it's really been a, a series of fascinating conversations and sometimes difficult ones <laughs> as the one we had today but i think it it all means that it, they're, they're essential to have and that uh, it's uh, it's also a new a new way forward uh, to, to be discussing them and to remind ourselves also that museums are not just a piece of history, but they reflect our present and future. And it's really our responsibility to keep them relevant. And uh, one of the means to do so is really through local, national, international cooperation to really avoid museum insularity with their own, with their own issues. So I'm really especially grateful for all the speakers for the time taken to share their experiences. We've had uh, 20 speakers over the, the last week, and, uh, and I really hope that it will spark interesting cooperation also in the museum field um, later on between France and Sri Lanka and, and other countries, of course. Uh, I also wanted to thank all the partners that helped uh, with this event. So we have our two media partners for Artra and Brunch Magazine, but also Institut Francais and the Noir Network of Alliance Française in Sri Lanka and the Maldives, who are um, helping us draft this project. Um, I'm of course at your disposal if you have any questions and um, I can put my email address in the chat box in case anyone wants to, to contact me or um, to continue these uh, conversations. So looking forward to future conversations on museums on these and uh, many more topics. And I wish you all a very pleasant rest of the week. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you very much.